Before Adventure Time returns with five new episodes starting July 17th, I want to revisit the Islands miniseries for some further analysis. This video will be a detailed discussion on the scene where Frida has her hat removed, and later I will release a video comparing and contrasting the story Martin told Finn in The Visitor to the reality we saw transpire in the Islands miniseries. But first, I got a sponsorship offer to do a brief shoutout that's actually directly relevant to Adventure Time. If interacting with a community of other Adventure Time fans interests you, check out The Fin Amino, a free social networking app dedicated exclusively for Adventure Time content. What's cool about the app is it provides a bunch of services all in one package. You can view and post fan art, blogs, help construct a fan-made wiki, live chat and roleplay, participate in polls. I made a poll asking which miniseries is everyone's favorite, and so far, Stakes seems to be winning. It also has fun quizzes that test your memory of various minutiae in the Adventure Time world. So if any of this sounds interesting to you, I recommend you give the Finamino app a whirl. So now, on to the topic of the video, the scene where remote-controlled Kara captures Frida. If you recall my mega-review of Islands, I had major praise for this scene overall, but wasn't fond of the slow-motion manner in which Frida's fabulous hair was revealed. I did not find the reveal that Frida also has luxurious hair to have any real meaning. If anything, the slow-mo shot detracted from the anguish Frida is experiencing by having her dreams be crushed by her best friend. It was just weird. Due to some great comments left by viewers like you, I was inspired to give this moment more contemplation, and I did change my mind about it, to an extent at least. There are interesting details I missed, and there are definitely viable interpretations for deeper meaning for Frida's hair and hat, but I still have some issues, and hopefully by the end of this video, you can see where I'm coming from and share your own thoughts on the subject. So, I'm going to split this follow-up discussion into three somewhat related topics, mood, lore, and symbolism. Let's discuss mood first. When Kara is first activated, there is an almost horror movie-like feel. Frida can't see Kara's face, and then Kara's head spins around super quickly. There's even an associated sound of neck bones popping to intensify the disturbing nature of Kara's head turn. Frida is aghast in her response to her friend's sudden change in behavior, ah! which is, again, quite in line with this particular scene indulging in horror aspects. The next shot starts with Kara's arm creeping toward Frida, while the rest of Kara remains out of frame. The framing is meant to make the viewer feel uncomfortable. There is a sense of violation, which is intensified by Kara hurting Frida and not even acknowledging it while under the control of her cybernetic implants. And since Dr. Gross is the one controlling Kara, Kara is actually acting both as the violator and as somebody being violated, making the scene that much more uncomfortable. And now finally to talking about the hair. One of the reasons I think the choice of slow motion for the hair reveal feels weird to me is that I typically don't associate slow motion with horror scenes. Well, actually, hold on, that's not true. Let me clarify that further before you freak out on me. Scenes containing psychological horror elements can certainly contain slow motion, and in fact can be greatly enhanced by the use of slow-mo, one famous example being the wave of blood in The Shining. However, what I'm getting at is that scenes where a violent act is committed by some agent in the story, which Kara removing Frida's hat would be analogous to, you don't generally see those sorts of scenes in slow motion. To use The Shining again, when an act of murder actually occurs, it's not going to be in slow motion. Slow motion tends to glorify violence rather than exasperate it, which is why it may be used in slashers and flicks where you're supposed to relish in the violence being portrayed rather than fear it. So when the scene with Frida and Kara uses horror elements in its framing and presentation, transitioning into slow-mo right after Kara performs her violating action doesn't gel well for me. Other ways slow-mo is used, when it's not trying to be epic, is to give the viewer more time to dwell on the emotions generated in a brief moment of time. A loved one falling to their death can happen pretty quick in real time, but with slow-mo you can really squeeze the emotional juice from a scene and give those feelings time to sit in the viewer. I don't think this applies to Frida's hair either, because it was only a couple seconds of slow-mo, and most of the heartbreaking moments occur after when Frida is struggling and begging Kara to stop. Perhaps the storyboarders thought, without slowing things down, the reveal that Frida has long gorgeous hair would be too surprising and ruin the moment, so they gave her hair time to breathe, so to say. 
The effect on me personally was the exact opposite, however. Slowing down for a couple seconds and fixating on her hair actually broke my immersion and screwed up my experience the very first time I watched this scene. That obviously will not be the case for everyone though. Some people thought the whole thing worked really well, and if for you it enhanced the experience, that's awesome. Unfortunately, as I've already been trying to explain, for me, it did not work that well. There is one detail associated with the slow-mo though that I really like, and that is the change in lighting from bright to a darker, more umber color, which also happens to match Frida's freshly revealed hair. The moment the scenery goes from daylight to dusk is during these few seconds of slow motion, which does help mark this moment as pivotal between Frida and Kara. It is the moment their friendship ends, at least for a long while. It's as if Frida's hair itself tinted the land a darker and more raw hue, and that's a pretty damn cool effect. Now enough mood talk, let's move on to discussing a bit of lore regarding hats. Some viewers informed me that I missed a really interesting hidden detail in the episode Helpers, where a computer in Dr. Gross's classroom lists three disciplinary measures. Bee cage. If you misbehave, you get the bee cage! Oh, no, not the bees! Not the bees! Ah! Out of my eyes! My eyes! Ah! But obviously, the thing of note in this screenshot is the second one, no hat. For Seekers, at least, it's a punishment to have your hat removed, and perhaps this is the case for experimenters as well. While Dr. Gross herself never wears a hat, the Seekers all have a fairly unified style of hats that are indigo or purple colored, and I'm sure their matching outfits are supposed to provide a sense of unity. In one scene, three people lack hats, one of which is asleep on the desk and the other is slumped, indicating that these are likely misbehaving students that had their hats removed as punishment. Experimenters seem to have mostly light colored hats and share some mild aesthetic similarity too, and helpers have hats that are straight up identical, likely to make identifying a helper the most simple task for a civilian in need. Therefore, Frida being stripped of her hat is separating her from this community. She stands out as an anomaly that doesn't fit in. However, outside of the classroom, hats are not a consistent piece of clothing. There does not seem to be a consistent social pressure for hat wearing or lack thereof. While Martin is a rebel and happens to not wear a hat, and some of the hiders we've seen don't wear hats either, there are clear counterexamples. In the re-education program, there clearly are hiders who still do choose to wear animal hats. And in the corresponding hologram to Dr. Gross's song, the hider portrayed actually has the largest and most eccentric animal hat of them all. Let me know if I'm wrong, but I don't think there's another animal hat out there more robust than this one. In island society, whether civilians wear hats or not seems entirely up to their own personal choice, irrelevant of ideology. I've actually already transitioned into discussing symbolism, and I actually think the Frida hair scene allows us to perform a case study on a larger question about storytelling in general. What constitutes effective symbolism? Let's dive into that question. Frida's hat representing the customs of island society would not make sense as various people from all blocks of life may or may not wear hats habitually like I already discussed. If we look at it from the perspective of profession and place in society, since hats are part of a standardized uniform, Frida being de-hatted others her, shames her, and separates her from her peers. This seems like a decent interpretation, but when we look at the bigger picture, contradictions begin to arise. Let's take a step back and realize what the events in this scene lead to. Frida being de-hatted also marks the moment she is reintegrated back into the system. Frida is captured and sent to re-education, and her dreams of adventure die. In this sense, the hat would represent Frida's trampled dreams and her buried desires. I mean, it just works so cleanly, the hat gets trampled by Kara just like their friendship, and the passage of time buries the hat just like Frida's wanderlust gets buried in her mind as she grows up after re-education. While independently these two interpretations work really well, they do not mesh together. The hat cannot represent Frida's dreams and ideals while also representing the opposite, society's strict expectations. And yet, to me, it seems like it's trying to do both at once. I hope you can sorta of see where I'm coming from here. I personally find some of the potential symbolism muddled and poorly integrated. The scene feels off to me because there's contradictory symbolism occurring simultaneously. Now, there is some symbolism that does work, and that revolves around the hat representing safety, as some commenters have suggested. 
I mean, historically, that was even the intent behind animal hats. Recall that animal hats were worn on a widespread basis as a defensive measure against vampire bites. What if I was a vampire? You need an animal hat. So what Frida loses in that moment of having her hat removed is the sense of safety she used to have. Even as a young child, Frida would deride her trade school and future career. Her disrespect of the system had an air of confidence. Look at this janky thing. I'm a dumb toy for babies. Experimenter stuff's just boring. While Frida knew Kara loved the island and the society established on it, and this kept her from effectively communicating that she wants to explore the outside world, Frida still felt safe around her friend. I mean, she tried to keep her escape secret, but I think that was to avoid hurting Kara's feelings, and in the end, she did ask Kara for help, and even asked Kara to join her in her escape, showcasing just how safe and comfortable she feels around her friend. Despite their different perspectives on life, there was a level of trust and safety between them. Their time together served as a sanctuary and respite. And that is what is symbolically removed and trampled when Frida's hat is removed and trampled. For one final quick topic of discussion, other good comments pointed out the choice of red as a color signifies intensity and passion, and of course, commonly refers to danger in literature. While Frida is spunky, she's still on the more reserved and timid side, especially when side by side with Kara. However, she has a burning desire for freedom and adventure, and a lust for exploration which is kept hidden under her more mild demeanor, just like her bright, fiery hair. It's fairly obvious why her hair color was chosen to be red rather than, say, brown or black. It further helps deliver the impact and message. Basically, to sum this whole video up, there's much more to Frida's hair scene than I gave credit for in my Island's Mega Review, and although I still have some issues with the scene, it's ripe for meticulous dissection and discussion. I hope this video helped all of you develop your own ideas and opinions, and please share any interesting thoughts you may have in the comments. Thanks for watching.